And then I was standing at one end of the same room, again aware that I was dreaming. I spoke to a woman I didn't know. She told me she was a training college lecturer. Oh no, you're a figment of my imagination, I declared, and reached out to grasp her arm. At this, I felt the most tremendous sense of shock. This was probably the most vivid moment of the dream. She was so real, solid, warm and fleshy. I remember thinking, it's exactly like holding a living arm. Yet I knew I was dreaming the contact. person becomes aware that he or she is dreaming and it then becomes quite different from an ordinary dream. For one thing it can be strikingly realistic to the point of producing a convincing replica of the normal physical world and for another it has its own psychological characteristics and range of emotional reactions which have to be considered independently of those experienced in normal dreaming. Dreams in which the subject considers the question of whether he is dreaming are called pre-lucid dreams. They share some of the characteristics of lucid dreams. The dreamer is usually in a realistic seeming physical environment and mentally alert. He has an intellectual curiosity about his situation which leads him to ask himself questions and perform experiments, which may sooner or later lead him to conclude that he is dreaming. If he does not come to the correct conclusion, the dream continues to be a non-lucid dream. The following two examples were reported by a German psychologist, Dr. von Mers Messmer. By a small river I am walking along a narrow path. I do not know the country, the place is strange to me. A woman is coming towards me and a large object like a hat box falls from her grasp into the water and floats. The woman climbs down the river bank, steps onto the water's surface, makes a few steps and fetches the object. This astonishes me and I leave the path so as to go down to the river and look at the water. I have forgotten whether there were ripples, the colour is green and rather dull, the top layers are transparent. I step on it and walk over to the other bank. At each step I sink in slightly, it seems like walking on sand. Looking around me I suddenly find the whole river covered with people who are walking across from the banks. The first surprise soon passes, I come to accept the facts as they are. But when I see a bridge at some distance, my unwearying intellectual curiosity stirs again. I begin to ponder. It cannot be ice, it is too soft for that, and besides, the air is too warm. Perhaps it is a new invention. But if so, why should bridges be built? Suddenly I have a flash of enlightenment. Could it not once again be a question of a dream? At first I feel a disinclination to accept this idea, but slowly convince myself that no other possible explanation remains to me. flat unknown mountain, I look out over a wide plain towards the horizon. The thought occurs to me that I do not know at all what time of day it is. I examine the position of the sun. It is almost vertically overhead in the sky and its usual brightness. This surprises me as it occurs to me that it is already autumn and a short time ago it was much lower in the sky. I think the sun is now standing vertically at the equator so here it must be at an angle of about 45 degrees. 
Therefore, if my shadow is not equal to my own height, I must be dreaming. I look at it. It is about 30 centimeters long. It costs me a fair effort to regard the whole almost dazzlingly bright landscape with all its villages as an illusion. Anything that strikes the subject as incongruous may lead him to ask himself questions and to come to the conclusion that he is dreaming. However, the imagery in the dream may modify itself as if in answer to the subject's questions, and he may fail to conclude that he is dreaming, as this dream reported by the physicist Ernst Mach demonstrates. At a time when I was much occupied with problems about space, I dreamed I was walking in a wood. Suddenly, I noticed the displacement of the trees was insufficient in terms of perspective, and deduced from this that I was dreaming. Immediately, the deficiencies in the displacements were made good. Then again, in another dream, I saw in my laboratory a glass beaker filled with water, in which a candle was steadily burning. Where does it get the oxygen? There's oxygen absorbed in the water, but where do the gases which result from combustion come away? Now bubbles began to rise from the flame, and my mind was set at rest. Two false awakening. 
it would, after all, be no more marvellous than many another mystery of creation. I thought of various opinions of the ancients on this subject, and remembered the following passage from Cicero. If someone had ascended to the heavens and had had a place for you of the sun, the moon, and the stars, this would nevertheless give him no pleasure if he had no one to whom he could have planted. I immediately wished to return to earth and find myself back in my room. For a moment I had the strange impression of looking at my sleeping body before taking possession of it again. Soon after that, I dreamt that I got up and pen in hand was writing a minute account of all that I had seen. Finally I really wake up. Almost immediately, innumerable small details of my experience, which a moment before had been perfectly distinct, vanished from my memory. If it is correct to classify this experience as an out-of-the-body experience, it is nevertheless atypical in one respect. It is unusual for the subject to imply that his out-of-the-body experience, even if it occurred during sleep, was subsequently subject to the same sort of amnesia as a non-lucid dream. On the contrary, it is more usual for a subject to say that his out-of-the-body experience is more memorable even than everyday waking experience.
like the idea of controlling their dreams, but actually the extent to which the dreamer can control his or her lucid dream is limited. It is particularly difficult to change the scene of a dream, and lucid dreamers have evolved a variety of techniques for doing this, such as covering their eyes and their hands in the dream, while willing the scene to change and spinning on the spot, also while willing the scene to change. One habitual lucid dreamer found it necessary to use a television set for this purpose, so he had to try to find a house in his dream in which there might be a television set, and if the dream provided one which was in working order, he would adjust the controls until the picture on the screen conformed to the place he wished to go to, and then he could step into the screen and make the required transition. Direct attempts to change the scenery may result in effects such as those in the following dream, in which the dreamer was on a tube train and wished to find himself in Kew Gardens. At a time I was deeply interested in the study of dreams, I occasionally realised that I was dreaming and made attempts at dream control. The most successful experiment I can recall was in connection with a dream in which I was a traveller on the underground. I decided that glancing out at Kew Gardens would look better than my surroundings. For that reason, I concentrated on the idea of this. Gradually, the roof of the carriage began to assume a dome-like appearance and become semi-transparent. The hands of the unfortunate passengers began to sprout twigs and leaves, and the legs of some of them to resemble stems. However, I woke up before the dream could develop any further. Lucid dreamers are sometimes successful in such enterprises as changing the colour of the sky or altering the season in the place in which they find themselves. Rather than influencing his dreams by making direct choices within them, the Marquis d'Hervé de Saint-Denis used techniques for producing selected people and circumstances. He went to considerable trouble to ensure the presence of two desired ladies that he knew in his dreams by waltzing with each lady to a certain specific tune at the dances he attended. Having provided himself with a musical box which played the relevant tunes and set it to play them while he was asleep, he then went to sleep with the musical box near him. This method apparently succeeded in evoking in his dreams the figure of the lady associated with the tune he had set his musical box to play. The Marquis is not very informative about whether the dreams were lucid at any stage, but he seems to have had a high opinion of lucid dreams as a way of experiencing whatever the heart could desire. Other subjects have also used lucid dreams as a way of having erotic experiences or varieties of such experiences which they would not have been able to have in waking life. The subject of the following account was an elderly gentleman, now deceased, who used lucid dreams to supplement his otherwise meagre love life. Although this account is written as if by a friend of his, he acknowledged that these experiences were his own. Up with an orgasm. 
According to him and knowing him well, I believe him. The tactile thermal sensations were just as real in the sense of a complete duplication as the waking experiences would be. As far as I can remember, he had a few of these dreams, and then the superego seemed to intervene, and no more ladies enlivened his nights when he was aware that he was dreaming. Alas.
If someone wishes to have lucid dreams, the most important thing is for him or her to think about the idea as they are falling asleep. And some of the techniques people have used are ways of focusing the mind to help bring this about. But many people have found that they start to have them just by thinking of this intention and encouraging their mind to dwell on the idea of lucid dreams and what can be done in them as they fall asleep. A slightly more formal version of this is to watch your mind as you fall asleep. Try to watch the dream imagery arising and enter the dream without losing your waking awareness. Some people have succeeded in this, but it seems to be rather difficult. What is more likely is that if you attempt it, you will become aware that you are dreaming later in the night, because the technique succeeded in the object of keeping your mind focused on the idea of lucid dreaming as you fell asleep. It is also useful to think of the idea of lucid dreaming frequently throughout the day and to ask yourself whether you are actually dreaming at the present time. A formal version of this technique is said to succeed with even the most difficult cases. And this is to ask yourself five or ten times a day whether you are dreaming and apply various tests to find out whether you are. First you examine your surroundings for incongruities which has the effect of encouraging the critical alertness which may carry over into sleep. Another good test is to ask yourself what you did before you did whatever you are doing at present and to see whether you can trace your memories back to the time you got up in the morning. This may not always be too easy to do in waking life but it encourages you to focus attention on it and in a dream you will usually find that your memories do not go very far back. And this has brought a number of people to the realization that they were dreaming. Other tests include jumping in the air, because if you are in a dream, you will float down gently instead of landing with the usual thump trying to lift things which you know you cannot really lift, but which you will be able to lift easily in a dream. And trying to push your hand through a wall, which may be possible in a lucid dream, though it is not always. One person had a test for finding out whether he was dreaming by trying to pass the handles of a knife and fork through one another. If he succeeded, he knew he was dreaming. Even if you do not carry out tests of this kind several times a day, it is useful to have a few in mind that you would carry out if you were ever to find yourself in a pre-lucid dream in which you were not sure whether you were dreaming or not. The early morning is a good time for having lucid dreams and several lucid dreamers have recommended that when you first awake you should keep yourself awake by reading a book or possibly even getting 
getting out of bed to ensure mental arousal and then going back to sleep with the intention of having a lucid dream. Remembering a non-lucid dream which you have just had and thinking of how it would have been if you had known it was a dream at the time is a technique which some have used. But really the point of this seems as usual to be mainly to focus the mind on the idea of having a lucid dream and what it is like to have one. Describing the techniques which some people have used to develop lucid dreams, we do not wish it to be thought that we are in any way advocating that people should do this. There have been suggestions that it might be bad for people to become too interested in their dream life, which might lead to their losing contact with reality, and also that people might be depriving themselves of the benefits physical and psychological, which may be produced by sleeping with only the normal sort of dreams. It has also been suggested that people might, if they cultivate the habit of asking themselves whether they are dreaming, sometimes ask themselves this question in waking life and come to the wrong conclusion, and do things which were a danger to themselves or to others, such as jumping out of windows. In fact, we have never heard of anyone complaining that lucid dreams had led them into trouble in their lives or into any form of danger, although of course it may be said that most habitual lucid dreamers are people who have liked the idea of having them sufficiently to devote some attention to developing them. And it is also possible that those who had any kind of unpleasant early experience connected with them simply did not continue. However, reports from habitual lucid dreamers are actually positive. They claim that lucid dreaming does not in fact diminish the value of their night's sleep, and on the contrary, that they sometimes derive from it an afterglow of energy and exhilaration which may last more than a day. We have never heard of a case of someone throwing themselves in front of the traffic to find out whether it would stop, as people sometimes do in lucid dreams, or doing anything of a similarly dangerous nature in waking life. However, we could not commit ourselves to saying that there were no risks attached to the developing of lucid dreams and certainly would not recommend anyone to do so if they had any disinclination for this form of experiment. In fact, for many people, their first experience of lucidity in a dream has occurred in a nightmare, in which the dreamer recognizes that he is dreaming, and 
uses this recognition to turn the nightmare into a less unpleasant dream or to awaken from it. In such a situation, the lucidity does not usually last long. However, if a dreamer wants to develop or extend the lucid periods in his dreams, he can think about the idea of lucid dreaming during the day and before he goes to sleep, so that he is more likely to become lucid during any nightmare that occurs, and thus have a way of controlling the nightmare. This way of relieving nightmares can be used by people of all ages, including children. The Marquis de Veda Saint Denis, a habitual lucid dreamer, was at one stage in his life suffering from a recurrent nightmare from which he managed to release himself by developing lucidity. In these nightmares he would find himself being chased by dreadful monsters through an endless series of rooms. These nightmares seemed to be becoming more frequent he only had to find himself in a room for the thought of monsters to arise, and then the monsters would appear. Finally, in one such experience, the recurrent situation made him aware that he was dreaming. And instead of trying to run away from the monsters, he set his back to a wall, determined to confront his pursuers. I stared at my principal assailant. He bore some resemblance to one of those bristling and grimacing demons which are sculptured on cathedral porches. Academic curiosity soon overcame all my other emotions. I saw the fantastic monster halt a few paces from me, hissing and leaping about. Once I had mastered my fear, his actions appeared merely burlesque. I noticed the claws on one of his hands, or paws, I should say. There were seven in all, each very precisely delineated. The monster's features were all very precise and realistic. Hair and eyebrows, what looked like a wound in his shoulder, and many other details. The result of concentrating attention on this figure was that all his acolytes vanished as if by magic. Soon the leading monster also began to slow down, lose precision, and take on a downy appearance. He finally changed into a sort of floating hide, which resembled the faded costumes used as street signs by fancy dress shops at carnival time.
some cases of lucid dreams in which people describe ostensible extrasensory perception. That is to say, they seem to become aware of events at a distance, of which they could not have had any normal knowledge. These accounts are anecdotal. Nevertheless, reports of this kind are persistent, both in relation to lucid dreams and to out-of-the-body experiences. The following account by Oliver Fox describes an experience which, if it is to be taken at face value, involves a false awakening on the part of the narrator and either a lucid dream or more probably an out-of-the-body experience on the part of his girlfriend, whom he called Elsie. Elsie viewed my experimenting with extreme disfavour. It was wicked, she felt, and God would be seriously angry with me if I persisted. Anyhow, she didn't like it, and that was that. And I, with all the painful seriousness of youth, explained to her that she was a narrow-minded little ignoramus and didn't know what she was talking about. Did she even know the meaning of astral projection? Yes, said Elsie with great emphasis, I do. I know more than you think. I could come to you tonight if I wanted to. I laughed rudely and immoderately. She knew no more of occultism, theoretical or practical, than I of needlework. Elsie, small blame to her, lost her temper. Very well, she exclaimed. I'll prove it. It's wicked, but I don't care. I'll come to your room tonight, and you shall see me there. All right, I replied, not in the least impressed. Come if you can. Then we ended our quarrel and presently I walked home, over a mile from Elsie's. I straight away forgot her in reading for my exams. I went to bed late and very tired. Her boast had seemed so childish, I never gave it another thought. Sometime in the night, while it was still dark, I woke, but it was a false awakening. I could hear the clock ticking and dimly see the objects in the room. I lay on the side of my double bed with tingling nerves. Something was going to happen, but what? what? Even then I didn't think of Elsie. Suddenly there appeared a large egg-shaped cloud of intensely brilliant bluish-white light. In the middle was Elsie, her hair loose and in her nightdress. She seemed perfectly solid as she stood by a chest of drawers near the right side of my bed. Thus she remained, regarding me with calm but sorrowful eyes, and running her fingers along the top and front side of a desk which stood on the drawers. She didn't speak. For what seemed to be some seconds, I couldn't move or utter a word. Again, I felt the strange paralysis which I've previously noted. Wonder and admiration filled me, but I wasn't afraid of her. At last, I broke the spell. Rising on one elbow, I called her name. 
and she vanished as suddenly as she'd come. It certainly seems to me I was awake now. I must know the time, I thought, but an irresistible drowsiness had overwhelmed me. I fell back and slept dreamlessly until morning. The following evening, we met and I found Elsie very excited and triumphant. I did come to you, she greeted me, I really did. I went to sleep willing that I would, and all at once I was there. This morning I knew just how everything was in your room, but I've been forgetting all day, it's been slipping away. Oh, that unscientific mind of hers, why didn't she make notes? Well, despite her impatience, I wouldn't say a word about what I'd seen until she told me all she could remember. So although this experience can never be absolutely convincing to her or anyone else, it is at least to me. She described the following. The relative positions of the door, bed, window, fireplace, washstand, chest of drawers and dressing table. That the window had a number of small panes instead of the usual large ones. That I was lying, eyes open, on the left side of a double bed. I had never told her it was double and seemed dazed. An old-fashioned pincushion, an unusual object in a man's room. A black Japanese box covered with red raised figures. A leather-covered desk lined with gilt. Sunk plate on top for the handle to fall back into, standing on the chest of drawers. She described how she was running her fingers along a projecting ridge on the front of the desk. You're wrong in just one thing, I said later. What you took for a ridge was a gilt line on the leather. There's no projecting ridge anywhere. Oh, there is, said Elsie positively. I tell you, I felt it. But my dear girl, I protested, don't you think I know my own desk? I don't care, she said. When you go home, look at it, and you'll find a gilt ridge on the front side. I took her advice. The desk was placed front to the wall, and the hinges, which I'd quite forgotten, made a continuous projecting ridge, just as she described. Owing to its position, she'd naturally mistaken the back of the desk for the front. Though elated by her success, she still maintained that such experiments were shit, and I could never persuade her to come to me again. I'm positive that Elsie, in the flesh, had never seen my room, for as she'd never visited my home, she couldn't have had a peek without my knowledge, nor could she have obtained a description from any common friend. I'm also quite sure I'd never told her about the pincushion, Japanese box, or the desk.
It is fairly remarkable that lucid dreams remained for so long unrecognized, since they seem in nearly all cases to be a pleasant and interesting experience and apparently accessible to people in general. The fact that they remained unrecognized, although potentially a common form of human experience, indicates how completely human beings are able to ignore features of reality which do not positively assist a worldview which they have decided to adopt. The fact that lucid dreams have remained unrecognized in this way makes it easier to find it credible that possible faculties such as extrasensory perception and psychokinesis might also have remained unrecognized. In the case of lucid dreams, it seems that they were found disturbing because of the doubt which they shed on the reality of the external world, and people derive a large part of their sense of security from a belief in the solidity and immutability of the physical objects which surround them. The fact that hallucinatory objects can appear to be convincing replicas of their physical counterparts is bound to suggest a doubt concerning the status of waking life. Descartes, for example, asked the question how we could ever know for sure that we were awake since a dream could be indistinguishable from waking life. This is probably an indication that Descartes had lucid dreams, because ordinary dreams are usually fairly easy to distinguish from waking life. So perhaps it is not surprising that lucid dreams seem to have been recognized in the past in association with religious or mystical traditions which viewed the physical world somewhat askance. The Tibetan Buddhist tradition, for example, thought that enlightenment was to be achieved by recognizing the hallucinatory nature of the external world, and one of the techniques they used for achieving this was to encourage people to shut themselves up in situations of sensory deprivation, say in a small dark hut, until they began to have hallucinations. When the hallucinations became convincing and solid enough, these people could venture back into the daylight world. And if they had been successful, their hallucinatory figure would accompany them, even casting a shadow. The idea was that they might then come to regard the whole of the external world as equally hallucinatory and equally the product of their own mind, and this realization was supposed to produce enlightenment. It seems that they, and one or two other mystical traditions at various times, considered lucid dreams a useful form of training in the right mental attitude. Gnostic Christians, although so far as I know not advocating the cultivation of lucid dreams, did assert the analogy of normal life as related to some higher state which they called the Gnosis, in the same way that dreaming in sleep is related to waking life.
Most people live as if they were sunk in sleep and found themselves in disturbing dreams. Either there's a place from which they're fleeing, or without strength they come from having chased after others. Or they're involved in striking blows, or they're receiving blows themselves. Or they've fallen from high places, or they take off into the air, though they do not have wings. Again, sometimes it's as if people were murdering them, although there's no one even pursuing them. Or they themselves are killing their neighbors, for they've been stained with their blood. When those who are going through all these things wake up, they see nothing. They who are in the midst of these circumstances, for they are nothing. Such is the way of those who have cast ignorance aside as sleep, leaving its works behind like a dream in the night. This is the way everyone has acted, as though asleep at the time when he was ignorant. And this is the way he has come to knowledge, as if he's awakened.